Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Steve Jamroz, and I'm the Director of Marketing here at DAN. I'd like to welcome you to our fourth webinar in our 21, 2021 webinar series, where we come together each month to discuss a new dive safety topic to keep you safer and better prepared. If you're watching our webinar for the first time tonight, tonight's presentation will be 30 to 40 minutes. Then we'll follow that up with a question and answer period at the end where we'll address any specific questions uh, that you may have. This webinar will also be recorded, so you, if you're either coming in late tonight or you need to leave early, you'll be able to watch the webinar in its entirety over on Dan's YouTube channel. Also, keep in mind if you're watching this event tonight from Dan's event page on dan.org, you won't be able to ask us any questions from there. You'll need to go to the um, YouTube page and you can put your questions the chat and we'll address those as they, they come in at the end. Tonight's presentation is entitled Environmental Considerations for Disinfection. And I think since COVID-19 has come on the scenes, we all have a better understanding of the role of cleaning and disinfection and what that plays into uh, our dive gear and how that can help to minimize the spread of illness. But keep in mind that all cleaners are not equal. They're all different and some are more harsh and more destructive on the environment than on others. So in tonight's webinar, we're going to talk about how to choose an environmentally friendly product. We're going to talk about how to effectively clean the dive equipment. We're going to talk about the disposal of that solution after you're done cleaning the dive gear. We're going to go through some best practices about how you can incorporate that into your dive business. Then we're going to discuss about how you can help divers and preserve the, the environment at the same time. Our presenter this evening is Chloe Strauss. She's with us tonight. She's the risk mitigation coordinator here at Dan. Chloe is a very accomplished dive instructor. She's taught recreational and scientific diving classes at the University of Indiana. Before coming to Dan, she worked as a molecular biology researcher studying bacterial genetics. Chloe is currently working to complete her master's of public health, expected to graduate this year. But before I turn it over to Chloe, on behalf of the entire Dan team, I'd just like to thank everyone for your support who's here tonight, through your membership, professional membership, business membership, your support of our insurance products. Make this night like this all possible, and we thank you for being here. So, Chloe, please take it away for us tonight. Thanks, Steve. So, like Steve said, uh, this presentation is going to be about environmental considerations for disinfection. This presentation won't be COVID specific, but we have learned a lot from COVID. Um, so this is going to be about what to do moving forward. Now, before we get started, I'd like to bring your attention to the fact that I will have QR codes throughout this presentation so that you don't have to contact us for any resources. You can just uh, download them yourself. So for those of you who haven't used QR codes before, if you open your camera application on your phone, it should recognize this code and offer you the option to open a link. And if you click the link, it will take you to whatever page I have linked to this QR code. So if you'd like to try this now, if you're doing it for the first time, this QR code here specifically will take you to our dan.org return to diving page. And that's a great QR code to check out. And if you're not yet familiar with Dan's return to diving program, this is a program we recently launched and we collaborated with our, our medics and our doctors and our researchers. And what we've really done is put together a comprehensive program to help divers get back to diving safely. Since COVID-19 has hit, you know, we've all been out of the water for an extended period of time, sometimes a year or more. You know, our health situation may have changed. We may have gained weight. Um, our diving skills may be just out of practice. We just haven't been doing it. So, We've encouraged all of our, our divers, all divers, please be careful before you get back into the water. Use that program, check it out before you get into water, into the water and, and return to diving safe. Yeah, absolutely. It's a really great resource. So with that, um, let's go ahead and jump right in. The first thing we're going to be addressing is why is disinfection even important? Well, it's going to prevent the spread of germs, whether that's by people, hands or surfaces. So there are a few uh, steps that you have to do before you get to the disinfection. The first is to clean. Cleaning is gonna physically remove any dirt or organic matter or even some germs from a surface. Um, harmful or pathogenic germs you know, may, may go off when you clean, but they might stay. The second step is to rinse, to move any, remove any um, soap or water that you use to clean. And then 
The third step is going to be disinfecting, which is going to destroy any disease-causing germs that might have remained on the surface after cleaning and rinsing. What do we want to look for in a disinfectant? Well, first we want to know what type this, this product is. Is it a cleaner, a sanitizer, a disinfectant, or even a combination? Um, some products are combination sanitizers and disinfectants, and it depends on the dilution or maybe the, the contact time, which is the time that the solution remains wet on the surface or item that you're trying to disinfect. Um, so usually if it's a combination sanitizer or disinfectant, you're, you'll just mix it differently or you might leave it on the surface for a different amount of time. The next thing we're going to look for is the EPA registration number. Um, the, we really want to know if, if it even has one. If it does, this means that they've provided research and proof that you're actually be going to be getting the benefits that they're claiming to give. If not, there's really no evidence to support the disinfection claims that the product is making. The next, of course, is contact time. So this is the, the time that the disinfectant must be left wet on a surface to kill germs and get your advertised benefits. And then we're gonna look if the disinfectant or solution or a product or whatever you're looking for is ready to use or dilutable. So ready to use is something that you're going to be able to pour out of the bottle and use as is. Dilutable means that you will take a certain amount of the product and put it in a certain amount of water. Um, and that will of course be specified on the directions for the product that you're using. What are we looking for in an environmentally friendly disinfectant? Well, first step is to check the SDS. Um, this used to be called the material safety data sheet. Um, now it's just known as the safety data sheet. And the hazards of any ingredients that are in the product, even the inactive ones, are gonna be spelled out on the SDS. This is gonna include um, ingredients, disposal requirements, toxicity to the environment, and any other really important factors that you need to consider. And then of course is gonna be the active ingredient. Um, the active ingredients that I have listed here on the slide are gonna be a little bit less harmful to the environment and can be used on scuba equipment. Other active ingredients that you might find on a list like this include um, ethyl alcohol or isopropyl alcohol, or some people know it as rubbing alcohol. Um, this would, of course, be environmentally friendly, but it should not be used on scuba equipment because it can damage some parts over time. Now we come to the disinfection application options. So how do you actually get the disinfectant onto the surface or item that you're wanting to disinfect? So liquids are probably going to be your best bet. These have um, the, you know, the easiest application. You spray something onto a surface or you pour it onto a cloth and then wipe the surface. Um, there's another option called an electrostatic sprayer, and this is a little bit less common, but it's designed to increase product coverage in the air. There aren't that many EPA registered products that are approved for use with an electrostatic sprayer. Um, but they're just designed to kind of increase the dispersion of these products within the air. The third one we have is fogging. And this just kind of saturates the air in a room with all of these droplets of disinfectants. Um, and research shows that this method actually might not be more effective than other methods. And it will just kind of increase the exposure of, of people to the, to the chemicals in the disinfectant and increase the exposure of the environment to those chemicals. If it's your only option, you know, you might try to use a safer ingredient, but really for, for scuba applications, uh, you know, this probably isn't going to be something that you'd ever really consider. So Chloe, a question for you. So you've, you've named a couple different application options. Is one of the application options better th than another, or is it more dependent really on the disinfection solution than how it's applied? Yeah, so for scuba specifically in the in the context that we're talking about here, probably, you know, the the most convenient way to do it is either to spray or or more likely a most the most convenient method is going to be, you know, having a a bucket or a tub of of a of a disinfectant solution and then immersing equipment in it. Um I would say that's going to be the most convenient okay. way to do it. During the last year of COVID-19, we've gotten a lot of questions about just different methods or, or types of disinfectants or, or just kind of alternative disinfection methods. So we're gonna go through a little bit on this slide. 
The first, of course, is bleach. Now, the CDC recommends a third of a cup of bleach per gallon of water with a contact time of one minute for COVID specifically. Um, I know some people might be kind of averse to, to wanting to use bleach on scuba equipment, but this is a relatively weak dilution that shouldn't harm scuba equipment. The next we've heard about is UV light. So this is actually pretty dangerous to human health, but it's also not gonna be the most convenient option for you um, at a dive shop. It can't get around corners and it can't reach into spaces where the light won't shine. So to do, um, to do scuba equipment, so for example, a regulator, you would have to take the entire thing apart, lay it out under the UV light, shine the UV light on it, flip all of them over because the UV light can't get to the backside, shine it again for the certain amount of time. It's just not practical. The third is ozone. So ozone is actually very hazardous to human health. We get this question from people who maybe uh, use CPAP machines at night um, and they have these ozone sanitizer machines, but they're really small and they're not going to fit most scuba equipment. I mean, other than a mask and even then the ozone levels that are required to disinfect are very high. They're going to degrade the, the materials and especially plastics that are in scuba equipment and they're toxic to human health. So they need to be enclosed. So again, this isn't probably going to be the most practical method of disinfection. Next comes sunlight. Um, this would be, if it, if it were a reliable way to, to do disinfection, it would be great. It's free. It's environmentally friendly, but it, it's just there's no way to guarantee that the correct temperature that you would need to disinfect is reached when you're just laying something out in the sun. And that brings us to hot water and heat. Different pathogens are inactivated or killed at different temperatures. So you'd have to make sure you look up the temperature for the certain pathogen you're wanting to inactivate see how hot for how long you'd have to heat the scuba equipment and then make sure that temperature in whatever you know you're you're doing it in remains consistent um and unfortunately many of these temperatures are actually hot enough to damage scuba equipment the next two slides are going to just be a spotlight about two very common ingredients the first is sodium hypochlorite which is of course the active ingredient in bleach um, bleach is really reactive. So when you uh, you mix up, you know, your one third cup of bleach per gallon of water solution um, and pour it down a drain at home uh, that leads to a wastewater treatment facility, it's going to react with all of that organic matter that you're putting down your drainage system. And it's going to just turn into salt and water before it even gets to the sewage treatment plant. Additionally, if you leave out, a, you know, say a bucket of bleach in the sun for a minimum of 24 hours, the sun and that organic matter, anything that gets into the into the solution is going to cause the bleach to break down completely um, before disposal. And, you know, if you're worried, you can always just dilute it and then pour it down the drain. There have been studies that show that, you know, large quantities of bleach can be detrimental to the environment, but household amounts have not have been found to have these same effects. So I have a question before we go on to the next slide. So you just talked about the bleach breaking down to salt and water. So for example, if I finish my day of diving, I clean my gear in a solution and I take the dive gear out and then, you know, the, the solution is sitting there and I come back 24 hours later, is it safe at that point to pour either on the ground or, you know, into the seawater or other type of water or what's the best thing I should do with that solution? The best thing you'd probably want to do, and that, that is a fantastic question, the, the best thing to do is to hang on to it until you have access to a drain that's going to lead to a wastewater treatment facility. You know, if you have a bucket on a boat, for example, or at the shop, you know, just once you're done, just pour it down the drain or down the toilet or in your bathtub or something that's going to lead to a wastewater treatment facility. So that would be that's a safer way to dispose. Of yeah, it, that yeah, would definitely sure. be considered best practice in this okay. scenario. The second ingredient that we're going to be talking about is quaternary ammonium compounds. These are one of the most common ingredients in cleaning products. So many products that have antimicrobial, antibacterial, or all-purpose claims will have quaternary ammonium products in them or commonly called quats. The most important quat is called benzalkonium chloride. 
If it's not benzalkonium chloride, a lot of these can be identified by their very long, complicated sounding names that sometimes have percentages stuck in the middle of them. Um, but most of the time you'll know because they end in ammonium chloride. So for example, here we have alkyl dimethyl benzyl ammonium chloride. So we know that's a quaternary ammonium compound. These have detriment detrimental effects to most aquatic organisms and even at very low concentrations. We're talking parts per million. Um, this includes algae, fish, barnacles, shrimp, starfish. I mean, it it's really not, not great for, for ocean life. Fortunately, if you pour this down a drain that's going to lead to a treatment facility, most of these will be removed because they will bind to the sewage solid, so they won't be present in water once it's, once it's kind of gone through the process and discharged. But if you're dumping these products uh, directly into a body of water, they will cause issues for marine organisms. So this kind of brings us to the, the next part of the presentation, um, which is how do I find these products. So the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is go into the search for EPA registrations in the EPA pesticide product and label system. And I have this linked in the QR code in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. Here you're gonna find um, directions for use, PPE, environmental, physical, chemical hazards. All of this information is gonna be in the registration. I'm not gonna go through how to look that up in the system today because we have gone through it in previous webinars. Um, if you would like to, to look at those, they are hosted on our YouTube channel and on our website. Um, you can also contact us with questions at riskmitigation at dan.org and that contact information will be on the last slide of this presentation. So I picked a product and I just went in and looked up its EPA registration. And this is just for a product called Biosec, Bioesc, Botanical Disinfectant Solution. Um, and you can see on the EPA registration document that it has the disposal instructions for the product. And I apologize if you can't read this at home, but it says, waste resulting from the use of this product may be disposed of on site or at an approved waste disposal facility. I also looked at the SDS. Um, this is where you can find toxicological, ecological, disposal information for the product. Um, this specifically says not toxic to aquatic life and dispose according to existing federal, state or provincial, and municipal regulations. So how do we find those? This can be difficult. So I've actually included two links for you guys on this slide to, to be able to, to look up disposal regulations um, you know, locally to you. But it's probably going to be the easiest if you start out by contacting your local office for more information. Um, another thing that would be good for you to know if you're, you know, at home searching for these guidelines is that the EPA classifieds in these registration documents, pesticides are also encompass disinfectants. So disinfectants are kind of included in the umbrella of pesticides in their registration system. And they also have pages where they where they write for kind of the lay person where they refer to pesticides um, in a more traditional sense that we know pesticides to be like something that you spray on your plants. So you just have to be aware that sometimes disinfectants will be under the umbrella of pesticides, but you have to kind of read the page and know if they're talking about disinfectants or if they're talking about pesticide pesticides that you would spray on your plants. Um, so the first QR code that we have here is the EPA hazardous waste programs by state. So you can click on the state and um, it will direct you to, to the page where you can find contact information for your state or local government agency. And then the second QR code is the Earth 911 search to find uh, recycling and disposal sites nearby. So I did a search for the zip code for Divers Alert Network and I found um, five results within 25 miles. So if I had, um, you know, a bottle of undiluted disinfectant or, you know, even a can of spray paint that I wasn't using anymore, I would be able to dispose of it at one of the five of these results. So Chloe, Chloe you, you pulled the results from around the, the Dan offices here in Durham, North Carolina, but we've got people joining us from all over the country and outside the country here tonight. But what would some good advice be for somebody who's not in the U.S.? Oh yeah, that's a really, really great question. Um, so I would say that it's probably best for you to start by contacting your local regulatory agency or your state or provincial regulatory agency to, for them to kind of direct you in the right direction. And honestly, I would even suggest that for someone who is in the United States because 
Regulations for waste disposal can vary widely from state to state or even from city to city. So disposing of disinfectants. It's really important to make sure that you're making a concerted effort to find out your local regulations, whether that's state or city regulations, and to follow the directions on the back of the bottle uh, you know, to the best of your ability. But the most important thing is to ensure that these disinfectant solutions aren't reaching the marine environment. Um, a lot of household drains, you know, in your house or at your business will lead to a water treatment plan. So when in doubt, you should dump the diluted solution down a drain. Um, if you have a bottle of, of something that's ready to use, of course, that's one thing. But if you have a, a, a bottle of a dilutable solution, it's important that you understand that these, once they're diluted, that's you know okay to put down the drain, but if you have a bottle of undiluted solution, that's something that you definitely want to contact your local waste uh, disposal uh, facility or, or find out the local regulations for that. Um, it's also important to avoid dumping anything down storm drains because these don't always lead to sewage treatment plants. Sometimes they'll just lead to the nearest body of water. Make sure if you have an open septic tank system that the liquids from there can't enter groundwater or the water table. And then you should always avoid discharging wastewater at sea. Um, this water should be disposed of on land for treatment. And if you're storing it with a product that's not harmful, um, if you're underway, you could release it slowly over a, a large, deep, open body of water. But the, um, the, the best practice here is always going to be to keep it and dispose of it on land. We get so many questions from people asking, what disinfectants can I use and then dump overboard? Unfortunately, this very likely doesn't exist. And if it does, we are certainly not aware of it. Um, when products are sent to wastewater treatment plants, the active ingredient is often removed or inactivated somehow. Um, and this does not happen in open water, whether that's salt water or fresh water. Even if the product will eventually inactivate or degrade by itself, it's still gonna do damage during the time when it's still active. So you have to remember that disinfectants and sanitizers are made to kill microorganisms and they don't always discriminate about which ones they kill. Additionally, even if there is a good or safe product out there, it might not be available where you are. Um, the QR, QR code on this page leads to the Environmental Working Group's Guide to Healthy uh, Cleaning. It's a really great resource and a great place to start if you're looking for better cleaning products. Um, the Environmental Working Group, or EWG, also has a bunch of other consumer guides for things like sunscreens and cosmetics, food. It's a really great resource for anyone looking to know more about the ingredients that are in products that we use every day. So what do we do with all of this information? Well, the best thing to do is to develop a standard operating procedure for disinfection, uh, for waste storage, and for disposal. This could require a little bit of creativity and potentially some reconfiguration of your current gear rinsing or disinfection procedures uh, to make things easier or even to facilitate disposing of stuff in a responsible way. There is no point in making standard operating procedures or any type of plan if that applies to all staff if you're not going to provide training or even share the plan. So be sure if you make new standard operating procedures or update your existing ones, be sure to communicate these new policies with, uh, with training or at least a high level walkthrough with supervision. Um, when you're making your SOPs, be sure that you are checking the SDS and directions for things like PPE requirements, like gloves or eye protection, which are very common when using uh, disinfectants. Um, disposal directions, contact time, rinsing, drying. Um, it's very important to note that most disinfectant products out there require you to obviously rinse, but also allow whatever item or surface you've disinfected to dry completely before using again. So it's important to, to, to know this because in some areas, you know, this is, this is difficult. They're very humid. Stuff doesn't always dry completely. So, you know, it's important to, to know that and maybe allow for some more ventilation or to get a big fan to put in your rental equipment room so that stuff does dry. The most important thing though is to be consistent, make sure it's done correctly, and 
train, 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 and supervise. Chloe, before we go on here, you can touch on a number of things on, on this slide, and, and it was Dan as an organization who, who is our core mission, it, it revolves around safety, and we have certain procedures and processes to handle emergencies. I mean, would you say it, it's more important than ever for dive businesses to have a, a written and understandable SOP for disinfection? Oh, is, yeah. Is so oh, important? absolutely. SOPs are so important, and especially when you have something like disinfection where you have to follow a certain set of directions and make sure they're done correctly for example dilution make sure making sure people are wearing uh proper ppe an sop has all of this written in one place so it's not only good for you to be able to see what your staff is doing and if they're doing it correctly it's a set of directions that everybody knows that they should be following so it's always a great idea to have to have a set of sops absolutely and inc to include disinfection and and storage in them yeah, as well. That's a great idea, especially with COVID, Yeah, sure. absolutely. What should your plan look like? Well, when disinfecting or sanitizing or cleaning, um, you shouldn't put something clean in dirty water or something dirty in clean water. It's important to keep these separate. Um, so for example, you'd wanna rinse equipment initially or do that initial clean and recognize that that's water, that water is dirty. Then you do the disinfection then you rinse in clean water. You wouldn't want to take something that has been disinfected and then rinse it in that initial tank. It's just gonna get dirty and potentially contaminate, to contaminate it again. Um, there's no one size fits all approach to any of these policies or procedures. And the most uh, convenient process or the one that you're gonna be able to stick to is gonna be the best one for you. The best way to come up with these is to kind of take a few minutes, walk around, try a few different arrangements, maybe talk to your staff about, about what they think is gonna be the most convenient for you as well. Um, contact time is also very important. Again, you know, this doesn't, um, this doesn't just mean that something has to be sitting, soaking in a bucket for say, if the contact time for your product is five minutes. It doesn't have to be soaking in that solution for five minutes. Contact time just means that the disinfectant solution has to be wet on the surface that you're trying to disinfect for the requisite amount of time. So what you could do if it's more convenient is have your, your tank or bucket of solution dunk everything in and you could pull it out and leave it to the side in another container for the time, you know, for five minutes. And if everything's still wet after five minutes, you are fulfilling that contact time. Another important consideration is that um, most of them will, will specify the rinse and dry time. So yeah, absolutely having a fan or increasing ventilation is gonna be incredibly important to make sure that you're following directions correctly. Some additional considerations include to be sure that you're regularly disinfecting or sanitizing high touch areas like uh, countertops in your retail spaces, uh, computer keyboards, card readers, uh, your fill station, and um, even cylinder hand wheels. Now, it's important to remember that these cylinder hand wheels are going into the water when people are going diving. So if you're using two kind of different disinfectant solutions, for example, maybe you're using a disinfectant wipe on the retail spaces, that you're not using these also on cylinder hand wheels, that you're using that same environmentally friendly disinfectant on anything that's going to enter the water. Um, another thing you can do is provide hand washing facilities to make it just much easier and more convenient for everyone to be keeping their hands clean. Um, if you provide hand sanitizer, remember that alcohol-based hand sanitizers aren't compa compatible with compressed gas. So the best thing to do is provide hand washing facilities. And if you do provide alcohol-based hand sanitizers, you know, you can make sure people aren't using them on the boat or just educate people, make sure their hands are completely dry before they touched anything to do with compressed gas. A lot of questions we get are about personal equipment. You know, do I need to disinfect my own personal equipment? Well, disinfection is most important between users of equipment. So if only one person is using a given set of equipment, disin disinfection isn't the, of the utmost importance. It's not super important that it's disinfected after every dive because it's not being shared between people. If the equipment ends up being shared, like you lend your alternate air source to your buddy or they orally inflate your BCD, of course, then it would need to be disinfected. If someone has their own personal equipment and they bring it to your shop, 
Um, if they elect not to follow your disinfection procedures um, or you don't require them to follow your disinfection procedures, don't let them contaminate any of your clean, clean water or, or you know, clean areas with their dirty equipment. Um, you can offer them their own personal rinse tank or you can offer to rinse their personal equipment off with a hose you know, before they take it home or back to their hotel room to, to rinse it. The bottom line is that you should have these procedures with an initial rinse or clean, disinfection, and then a clean rinse, or you should have everyone taking their own equipment home and rinsing it there. So before we go on to the next slide, I've got a, I've got a question because I've got a, actually a personal dive trip coming up and I'll be going down to Key Largo to do some diving and diving with one of the local operators there and I won't be bringing my own, my own gear with me this time. Um, you know, we'd be diving multiple days, be renting the gear, I'll be storing the gear at my hotel room each night when I come home. Um, does disinfecting the gear after each dive or after each night, does that give me any additional level of protection against your COVID-19 or, or anything I maybe picked up on the boat? Is that worthwhile doing? I mean, you know, it's certainly not going to hurt, but if nobody else is using your equipment, you know, even though it's rental equipment, you are having it for, you know, three days, four days, two weeks, and nobody else is using it, you can treat it as your own personal equipment um, and you don't have to disinfect it, you know, after every dive. Of course, if you lend your alternate air source to your buddy, like I said, and they use it, you'd want to give it a little bit of a disinfection. But for personal equipment or rental equipment that only you are using and you are taking it back with you to rinse, um, you know, disinfection could be considered optional. Some additional actions you can consider for your standard operating procedures are to make sure products are stored securely to minimize any risks of misuse or for spillage. Um, antibacterial soap, you know, it's actually not really necessary if you're washing your hands uh, properly and often. Um, there's not really any benefit to, to using an antibacterial or antimicrobial hand soap because a lot of those pathogens will be washed away with the soap and water anyway. Um, and if you're having wastewater from cleaning showers or toilets that, you know, will be could potentially be discharged or directly or through a holding tank, you know, you want to make sure that you're definitely using the products that are that are more environmentally friendly if you're cleaning stuff that's going to lead to storage in the wastewater. Um, or better yet, just store the water until you can dispose of it on land. So that brings us to the end of the presentation. Some important takeaways from this are to choose an environmentally friendly disinfectant with ingredients that are less harmful to the environment. Um, make sure you, you are wearing PPE or you're providing your staff with the PPP, PPE as defined in the directions for the product that you're using. Um, dispose of your disinfectant solutions responsibly. The first thing you should be doing is looking at the, the directions for the product and also looking at your local regulations. You need to do your best to find out what those are and follow them as best as you can. Um, if you know they say that you can pour things down the drain that will lead to a wastewater treatment facility, that's great. Um, but just make sure you, you look those up and, and are following those directions adequately. Um, and lastly, you need to make sure you're training staff in your new disinfection procedures and make sure they're being executed correctly. Now, before we open it up to questions, um, I just wanted to say that you are more than welcome to ask us about specific products and you're more than welcome to ask about specific products here in the live chat. Um, there is obviously a chance that I've never heard of this product and unless someone else has asked and I've looked it up previously, it's very likely that I won't be able to answer your question. So what I would recommend doing is if you wanna know something specific about a specific product or a specific active ingredient, please contact us at riskmitigation@dan.org or you can call us at 919-684-2948, option two for safety and training. Um, but please put your questions in the chat. We would love to answer them for you. Awesome, Chloe, and, and that concludes the presentation uh, part of the uh, webinar tonight. So we're going to open up for questions. If you've not yet asked a question, you have that on your mind, please put that in the chat uh, window in YouTube and we'll get to that. We did have a couple questions come in uh, d during the presentation. Uh, so let me go through those with you here and hopefully we can get answers to uh, these questions. So John asks, um, 
says a really popular wetsuit disinfectant in Hawaii is called Bacto. It says it works well. It's not reef safe though. It says sink the stink is less effective and is more expensive. Is there an alternative to what he's talking about there? Or could you speak specifically about the different cleaners? Yeah, you know, in terms of infectious disease, well, let me just start by saying it's, it's wetsuits are very hard because they're so porous. Um, it's really hard to find a disinfectant that will, will clean them adequately. So for infectious disease and infection control purposes, you know, we're not particularly concerned about wetsuits. We are more concerned about the items of equipment that are gonna go on your face, um, contact to your mucous membranes maybe, like your eyes and nose. So that would be masks, snorkels, regulators, and BCD oral inflators. Um, wetsuits aren't gonna be, you know, you're not gonna put them in your mouth. You kind of put them on and take them off. So they're not gonna be, you know, a primary like transmitter of, of disease or infection. Um, so unfortunately, yeah, you know, that, that is a question that we've been trying to find a really good solid answer to for a year. And we just don't have anything uh, really solid to say about it yet. But, um, you know, if this wasn't a good enough answer for your question, please email me about the stuff about um, the, the two products, the Bacto and Sink the Stink uh, <laughs> risk mitigation at dan.org. And I am more than happy to do more research and even reach out to the EPA for you. Excellent. Okay, we've got another question here. This one comes in from Rick B. Uh, he says, five to 6% bleach is a typical concentration for household bleach. Is that concentration one third cup per gallon of water? Right, okay, so what I think, so bleach is five to 6% sodium hypochlorite. So the active, in, it's five to 6% of the active ingredient, usually household bleach. And so what we're saying is to use a, a third of a cup or what the CDC is saying is to use a third of a cup of just regular household bleach in a gallon of water, which gives you a more diluted concentration. Um, you need to watch out, I think, for some bleach that's like a low splash, splashless bleach, because it's thicker and it might be a lower percentage of sodium hypochlorite, but it is just a third of a cup of regular household bleach per gallon of water. Excellent. Got a couple more questions that, that came in during the discussion here. This one is from uh, Moo Nash, if I'm saying that uh, correctly, he says, what's a good length of time to rinse with standard one-third uh, solution? Is there a, you know, a typical yeah, there's, guideline we could give him? There's not really a standard uh, rinse time, I would just say very thoroughly. Um, with bleach, if you're, if you're disinfecting with that you know, one-third cup bleach solution, Oftentimes with bleach in general or a bleach based products, you are going to get some residual smell and what allowing the equipment to dry afterwards does is not it will not only get rid of the smell, but the drying action will cause the rest of the uh, sodium hypochlorite that's remaining on the equipment to break down. So just rinse it really thoroughly, but most importantly, allow it to dry before use. Got another uh, interesting question here. This one came in from uh, Rick B. You know, when we think of diving, we obviously think about the ocean, but we do a lot of training and, and refresher updates sometimes in pools. Rick B. asks, how effective is chlorinated water in a typical public swimming pool versus COVID-19? Do you have any data that yeah, would suggest that? According to the CDC, you know, they're not really worried about COVID transmission in a chlorinated pool, but that doesn't necessarily mean that chlorinated water is going to be an adequate disinfectant. Um, it's it's a very low concentration of 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 uh, you know free chlorine, so it's not going to be the best thing probably to use as a primary disinfectant. Even if you're in a chlorinated pool, you want to still get out and disinfect afterwards. Another question came in from uh, Nick. N Nick asks. Is there any disinfectant product that's safe to dispose of in the ocean or marina or on the ground? We talked a little bit about that earlier, but what, what advice would you give to, to Nick here? Yeah, I mean, I, I wish I could say yes. There's a product and, and you can buy it here, but unfortunately that's just not the case. Um, you know, you have to remember that these products are designed to kill microorganisms. That's, that's really what they wanna do. They don't always discriminate. Um, and, you know, if you pour something in the ocean, it's, you know, it might break down, but on the way to doing that, it's going to cause damage. Um, 
So at this point in time, you know, we're we're unaware of anything that you can just dump directly into the ocean. So the best thing to do would be, you know, to save it um, and dispose of it on land. That's all the questions I see, Chloe, that, that, that have come in to, through the chat board uh, this evening uh, after the presentation. Uh, keep in mind, you know, we're Dan, we're here for you. Uh, if you have additional questions, you can call our medical information line. That's for non-emergencies that operates during normal business hours, and we're happy to answer your, your dive health and safety related questions. So if there's something that we didn't cover here tonight, you can always contact Dan. So um, that concludes our, our presentation for this evening. Um, we hope you'll join us next month. Uh, in May, our next presentation will be discussing returning to diving safely uh, with Dr. Tillmans. We touched on that program tonight, and there's a lot of great information available on the website. Next month, she'll go through that program in great detail to help you and your divers get back to diving safely. Uh, in June, we have a program, COVID-19 in Diving. And that will be, pre be presented by Drs. Chimiak, Neshedo, and Sariva. Both of those presentations will be at 7 o'clock Eastern Time. We hope you can join us. Um, thanks to you all for being with us here tonight. And a special thanks uh, to the Dan members who are tuning in with us tonight. It's through your support of Dan and it really enable us to do what we do here for, for the benefit of all divers. So we thank you very much for that. That's all for us tonight. Good evening, and we hope to see you next month. Thank you.